So is the stigma from towards mental illness, is it the same today as it was 10 years ago? No. No. So what, how has the stigma for mental illness changed in some way? So for some, when they say mentally ill or nervous condition, they may be referring to one thing, but when you start saying folks are cray cray or they're psycho, you know, those sorts of things, it has a different sting to it. So in your opinion, how has the stigma, the label associated to mental illness changed throughout, let's say, the past decade? What have you seen? Many of you have been in the field um, for many years, but what has changed in this last century as it relates to how we view mental illness in this country? So while you're thinking, if you think historically, if you go back to when they was doing frontal lobotomies, drilling holes in people's head, many individuals were under the belief that if a person had a mental illness, they had a demon. And you had to perform some type of exorcism to cast the devil out. Well, some people don't, don't have a demon or got some type of spiritual thing going on. They just need to take their medication. So I think a lot of times when people are misinformed, you know, there's a... Um, a uh, particular passage in this book that I read that talks about people um, suffer for the lack of knowledge. So when individuals don't have knowledge and insight about mental illness and about this being a neurobiological disease and chemical imbalances, sometimes individuals are ostracized, even in the community and churches by their families, because people don't have a clear understanding of what mental illness is and how to treat it. So back to my original question. How has the stigma of mental illness in our country changed throughout the past couple of years, generations or so? Or just whatever your thoughts are. I think one, it kind of goes against what I said a minute ago, but it's more socially acceptable now. Where 50 years ago we locked that person away. Mm -hmm. Today, they are being blended into because of medications and things like that rather than what's, what's been happening rather than keeping them locked away in facilities. They're out in the community. Persons with mental illness are out in the community now and, and functioning in, in some ways. So some of my beliefs in the past that that individual would have to be locked away. Some of society's beliefs in the past that that individual would have to be locked away and maintained and hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that folk with mental illness, I can come up and say I have a mental illness, but I'm out in the community functioning, that's beginning to change some of the stigmas and, and the beliefs that folk have had about mental illness in the past. Do you think our society has been a little desensitized? Yeah, and what you said too, knowledge, you know, because of the mental health reform, I think now, you know, what's that knowledge is power, and I think mm. in the fact that people have more knowledge now than what there was 10 years ago. Right. So, so, well, I would say a little bit of both. So the desensitized piece and then the, the acceptance. So the acceptance piece was you, the people are accepting like, oh, that's just Bebe or that's just Uncle Joe. Accepting people as they are, but being desensitized, I'm referring to that they're not making a big issue out of it. You know, like, okay, it's bipolar. Think about the term bipolar itself, because we're going to deal with mood disorders today. The term bipolar itself, it's like... A common word now, but there was a day and time that people would not self-proclaim to be bipolar. They would say, jokingly, I'm having a bipolar moment because it was such a label to it. I would say, there's a bipolar building. Okay. Now, you know, I was going to say that, but yeah. But we just use it more loosely now, you know. We'd say, well, you know, they bipolar. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, great segue into our conversation today because in this country we are more accepting of mental illness. People are more accept accepting. Systems are more accepting. So think about in some organizations.
organizations, even in some church communities, they tend to ostracize the people with mental illness to like a particular section. And you're telling security, watch them, something ain't right about them. But when you begin to educate individuals, even in the church or even in other community institutions, Communities are more open to it now to say, okay, that's just such and such. You know, you may see people that's a little off. They start doing some things that's strange, but you don't make a big deal out of it. And even with training such as this, we're now training law enforcement on how to actually interact and to work with individuals with mental illness that they're not always assuming. Because sometimes aggression is not necessarily that the person is trying to attack you or trying to take you out, but it may just be a part of that manic phase. So as we look at bipolar today, mania, so bipolar means to buy. So like a bicycle, two wheels. So with bipolar, we're talking about someone that swings from two poles, from a pole of mania, happy, excited, you know, on fire, pants on fire, you can't sit them down. And mania looks different for different people. And then you have that pole of depression. Now, we're not talking about, you know, I just got the blues feeling bad, but depression that this person stays stuck in that place of not bathing, not washing, sadness, fear, um, feelings of hopelessness, those sorts of things for a period of time. So we're going to look at some of those things today because a lot of times people say they're having a bipolar moment. When you really have a clear understanding of what bipolar is, it, bipolar ain't just a moment. It goes from what it ain't like the almond joy and the mound that we talk about. Go ahead, Miss King. That's just like oftentimes I know, um, you know, you got guys come in that there for 90 days and they say, like, Miss King, I'm depressed. I'm like, okay, so what are your symptoms? And I'm like, well, first of all, you're not getting high. You're here for 90 days, don't want to be here. There's a difference in being depressed and being sad. Or even sometimes, you know, people, and I don't think oftentimes as clinicians, sometimes we don't address enough of post-acute withdrawal symptoms too. And, and that's why it's dark, you know, if guys don't come in with the history, we give that two-week window mm -hmm. to um, determine whether there's some type of mental illness or whether it's post-acute withdrawal symptoms. Now, now you know you talking good because you you finna open up a whole can of worms because a lot of times individuals high as a cooter bird you know they just geeked up they peeking out the blind they all on the floor doing all this stuff and for someone who is unlearned they may say they crazy no they ain't crazy they high. And if they show up at the emergency room and if someone hasn't notified the staff that they're under the use of some mind and mood altering substance and if they in there acting crazy, they seeing things, hearing things, the, the medical staff may say, oh, there is some kind of psychotic break. No, he high, he been on a crack bench for seven days, ain't ate nothing, he might, you might be tripping too when you start thinking about what happens in the brain. So sometimes people get misdiagnosed with mental illnesses, but then after they get clean and sober, after the cloud suddenly clears in their brain, then suddenly it's an aha moment. Maybe we've misdiagnosed, but no, no. That diagnosis has been locked and loaded in their chart, and then this person goes from one agency to the next, and they got a diagnosis that ain't bit more schizophrenic in a moment. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so and then knowing the criteria, and we're going to look at that criteria today. So we have to rely on that global criteria. So when we look at the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, we have to rely on that criteria. If that person doesn't meet the time parameter, meaning the manifestation, the symptoms that's being seen, we shouldn't be diagnosing people because a whole bunch of folks, especially children, are being diagnosed quick, fast, in a hurry with bipolar. And there was a day and time you wouldn't dare even think to um, label or to diagnose a child with mental disorder. You would say, just give it time. They'd just be going through some things. But now we're living in a country that there's a pill for every ill. That it's easier to write a prescription than to go through the process with somebody. To really sit down and dialogue to figure out what's going on in the mind. So, that concludes our little introduction to our conversation on today as it relates to mental illness and the stigma associated with it. So, some, here's some additional reasons why people actually hide mental illness in our country. So, of course, being misunderstood that some people say, well, it's easy for me just to keep it to myself and not tell anybody. But the shame associated with mental illness. There is fear 
um, the first time you've had symptoms, and so somebody said, well, I'll just outgrow it, or this may just be as a result of a relationship, or how a mood I was feeling. You ever hear people say they was moonstruck, and they run into the calendar and see if it's a full moon? Or if it's a half a moon, and you know that kind of now, it might be some credence to that because I can recall working at <laughs> at Charter Hospital many years ago. Lo and behold, it never failed. If it was a full moon, intakes and emergency services, it would be off the hook. You would have people coming in that then took themselves off of their meds. You know, just really going from one extreme to the next. So it may be some credence to it, but then there are some who have mental illness that the changing of the moon doesn't have anything to do. It doesn't change them. So we have to be careful when we start labeling folks as being moonstruck. Go ahead, Ms. King. But it's something to it. Because I work at Baptist Hospital, the emergency room. I work at the jail. And I, I, it's just something about behavior when there's a full moon. It, it, I'm just telling you. The, the mercy room was a whole lot busier with a full, full moon than it when it was. Well, I ain't a moonologist. I don't know the former term for it, but I don't study the stars and the moon. But it's, you know, sometimes there's some correlations. Yeah, it's the human body is made majority of water, and water is affected by the moon. Yeah, and it's But child, y'all teaching me something because I don't know nothing about all that. I tell you, the hospital emergency room, jails, the behavior, I, I, I'm telling yeah. you, I've been there. It, it's different. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have any uh, scientific research or evidence base to, to produce, you know, to say that these are just observations or hypotheses, our educated guesses about these things. Um, some other reasons about mental illness why people will hide it. Your illness causes your reality to be distorted and you're unaware of it. What does that mean? A mental illness, someone will hide it because your mental illness causes your reality to be distorted and you're unaware of it. For example, if your perception, we talked about some personality disorders yesterday. So let's say the narcissistic personality or the borderline personality. So I've had um, clients that they look like death on a soda cracker. Honey, but the mental illness had a delusion because we talk about some delusions and those fantasies will have them feeling like or thinking that they look like some wonderful prima donna as they're walking the, the prostitution stroll. So the delusions that causes their reality to be distorted, that is something that is not. Also, the reality, like, they're not going to lock me up. I have... Uh, tested dirty on probation. I have went and robbed a bank. And you know, just these, sometimes mental illness will have their perception of reality to be off. You know, the time, and you, you've heard stories of people just doing things, and they didn't, the reality of it didn't make sense. It didn't make logical sense. But remember, when you're working with a person with mental illness, what makes sense and rational to you and I? Remember we talked about the brain yesterday? and the different things that's going on in the brain, how they're rationalizing and interpreting information, interpreting scenarios, is not going to be the same. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Then there's um, suicidal um, issues that go right along with um, why persons with high mental illness and then homicidal. Because some individuals, when they are mentally ill, they do struggle with what we refer to as suicidal ideations and homicidal ideations. As you all did that exercise yesterday, hearing voices. Now, if you had to hear those voices all day, every day, and the voices in your head is telling you, kill yourself, you're nothing, you're never going to be nothing, and multiple voices all at the same time. So not to say we're going to um, somewhat co-sign, but can you have a, a, do you have a better understanding? After doing the exercise yesterday, a better understanding why some of the individuals with that level of mental illness and psychosis may become suicidal. And then if those voices or those the delusions in your head is telling you that someone is trying to kill you. When we talked about schizophrenia, there's a paranoid type of schizophrenia that some individuals are paranoid that someone is trying to kill them, they're trying to poison them. Then there's that type of schizophrenia that they are so fascinated with the government that the government, I actually had a man, he um, 
appalled and was threatening the, to kill the president while he was in one of these suicide psycho psycho psychosis phases. So see, these individuals will do a number of different things. They'll give out death uh, threats and things because of the delusions. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Did you so have to, did, you, did you have to report him to the Secret Service? Well, I wasn't. When I heard about that, Secret Service was already involved. Okay. That they, right. yep. oh yeah, mm -hmm. so they was ready to take him out, but somebody had to intervene. It wasn't me, but somebody had to intervene to say, "Listen, he's mentally ill." Because remember, mental illness can fool you. Because well, a person looked like normal. Had a history of mental illness and had, had reported it to mental health. So what now? The guy that shot Reagan had a history of mental illness and it had reported it to mental health. He had talked about killing the president a number of times. Yeah. Look at all the, the different things that have occurred recently in this country. Remember the guy who went into the church and killed all those people in South Carolina? That boy had to be mentally ill some mm -hmm. kind of way. Mm -hmm. And then what about the guy who went into the movie theater? Mm -hmm. This is why we need to encourage people to take medication and follow through with your appointments because there are signs and symptoms that a clinician would have been able to see. And then there are some individuals, because of the level of their mental illness, when they get off of their meds and they're wanting to kill somebody and all this kind of stuff, it's real to them. And they get a hold to a gun and this sort of thing. It, it really occurs. So this is why we really need people to be educated about mental illness and about the do's and don'ts and don't take it for granted. And a lot of times families are misinformed about mental illness. So definitely in the African American community, we are such believers and we get so caught up into church and religion that we just think we just going to pray it away and we going to shout it away. And you know, because when you start looking at counseling and the statistics, there are many uh, persons of the African American culture, they will go to their church, go to their pastor, and that pastor don't have any training and knowledge in mental health, and they're going to pray for them, but then at the same time, we need to make sure that we're educating church leaders how to help that client get back to their psychiatrist or their medical medical doctor to follow through. And then we know there are some other cultures, like think about the Asian culture, so kind of putting in a cultural competency piece here. If you think about Asians, you don't see a lot of them in programs, in treatment centers, because you know why? They take care of their own within their community. Does that make sense? Does that mean there are not Asians with mental illness? Absolutely not, because mental illness is one of those equal opportunity destroyers that it doesn't matter who you are, your race, color, gender, creed, what side of the tracks that you was raised on, just like addiction, mental illness can affect anyone. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. All right, last but not least reason why some people will hide mental illness is that they may say it's none of their business. It's none of their business. Why should I tell anybody? So before we go to the next part of this train, I want you to think for a moment. You recently just got this great raise, the job of your lifetime. You have been waiting all of your life to get this job. So you've got the promotion, you love the people that you work with, and then two weeks in, you're just getting accustomed. They upgraded your office, you have all the nice furniture and everything, and then they come out with a new policy that says, all persons who have a diagnosis of a mental illness will no longer be allowed to work at such and such and such facility. Those, those persons need to report such information to their supervisor as soon as possible. I noticed as I went from exciting, promotion, best job ever, to now you're required to report it by show of hands. How many of y'all don't go to your supervisor? Mr. Such and Such, I just come to let you know I do have a mental illness. Because notice, this, all this is a made up story so y'all can just relax. So, if, you know, because there might be some diagnosis in the room, so just chill, take a breath. So, what if, because it, the policy didn't say what type of mental illness, it said mental illness, right? Because there are some individuals who wouldn't dare share that. So, Ms. King, let's start with you. No. You said, I ain't telling them. I ain't giving them my money back. I ain't giving them my promotion. This is the greatest job ever. Why wouldn't you tell them? So, if you had a mental illness, because that mental illness could be something as simple as anxiety, depression, 
Why wouldn't you share that with your employer? So we talked about why other people but wouldn't share mental not, illness. Because that's what really, I, I, you know what, I say no. No. Because, you know, a person is dealing with mental illness, I, I was thinking something like that, that I'm not willing to take my medicine. I, I don't think I would, but then, at the same time, I say no, but I've been in situations, and I, you know, other before dark even, that I had to share my history mm -hmm. of addiction. You understand what I'm saying? And, and when I was put in that position, where do I tell them or do I not tell them? Mm -hmm. I told them. So I, I say no, but really I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. So would there be some fear? Absolutely. Would you have some fear of losing your job? Absolutely. Would you have some fear that your coworkers would treat you differently? Do you have fear that people will talk about you or stigmatize you or label you? So just as I just engaged you all in that little exercise and the mood in the room changed, put yourself in the seat of your client, your offender, that has a mental illness that's afraid to talk about it because they don't know how you're going to treat them. They don't know how you're going to look at them, if you're going to really understand them. So just as you wouldn't share, when you sit down and do that intake with your offender, they may not always tell you everything at that first session because they don't trust you. They don't know what you're going to do with that information. So this is why we need to watch and be observant all throughout their time that they're in treatment with us or when we're around them. Because just because they don't say that they have a mental illness, it doesn't mean that you won't be able to pick up on it. But see, even when you talk about even the sexual abuse, because see, I do most of the screenings, you know, for the, um, set, the victimization forms, Sometimes they will tell me, because they're just coming into the facility, and sometimes they will, sometimes they will. And even after they've been in situations, and I don't know if it's because he's a male, that they tell me no, and then later, later they will tell their counselor that yes, I have. You, you understand? Yeah. So, so it's really all about making sure, because remember as counselors, y'all, we don't have such great power, but what we do, we're in tune with who's in front of us, and we create an environment that's conducive, an environment that's judgment-free, that we're able to help them to make sense of all the junk that's going on in their head. So even as clinicians, when we're skilled, we can even keep up with a schizophrenic, who's a person with schizophrenia, that they didn't went from one thing to the next to the next. They got five conversations going on in their head, but we're just keeping up with all those bits and pieces to help them to make sense of it. Because if you're frustrated, they really frustrated. And then when they feel like you understand, they be like, yeah, you get this. Well, it took some training because I had to figure out this part over here five minutes ago, go with what you said 10 minutes ago. And I'm gonna put all this together to kind of understand what you talking about. Does that make sense? So it does take skill and it does take training to understand that and know how to deal with people. And you know, many persons, they decide, I don't want to face having to go to a job with a mental illness because I don't want people to treat me different. Mm -hmm. And so some people will opt to just stay on disability versus trying to get a job. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, well, that's a whole nother conversation because we don't know what's going to exist, you know, as it relates to SSI, disability, social security, or whatnot. Any other thoughts as it relates to if you would share your mental illness, if you had one, with your staff. Why wouldn't you share? I think one of the reasons because I think anything that I did would be attributed to my mental illness. Mm. And I'm down the road, you know, everything would just be that happened because he has a mental illness, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, you know, so, no, I wouldn't. So you think it could be used to, he could always something that can be used against you? Mm -hmm. And we would like to think that people would honor the ADA. Y'all know the American Disability Act of 1990 says that you have to give reasonable accommodations to individuals with any type of disability, whether it's mental, physical, emotional um, disability. So sometimes we say we adhere to the American Disabilities Act of 1990, 
However, we find other reasons to get rid of people. So when you start thinking about why people do or do not share their mental illness with their coworkers, it's because of that kind of stuff. You know, we live in a state, North Carolina, that it's an at-will state. They can fire you, get rid of you for any reason. So sometimes people don't come to work and openly share, I needed to take a mental health day. My medication was a little off. People will opt to just take two weeks of vacation, lock themselves up on a psych ward, get their medication regulated, then come on back to work like nothing happened. Because there is still such a stigma in the 21st century for mental illness in this country. All right, so let's keep going. So when we talk about mood disorders, so yesterday we talked about schizophrenia, psychotic disorders, schizophrenia and personality disorders, so on and so forth. Today we're going to spend our time focused on mood disorders. So when we talk about mood disorders, this will include such things as major depression, bipolar disorder, also known as manic depression. We're going to look at uh, impulse control disorders such as OCD. So there's a difference between having obsessive compulsive disorder and someone who likes things. What did you say yesterday? Knee orderly. Knee order and comfort. So there are some people who just like things to be in order, but then there are some folks, if your desire for things to be neat and in order disrupts your life, your routine, you can't get to work because you got to make sure everything is in order and you didn't did all this stuff or you getting up three hours early because you want to make sure you they don't leave no lint on the floor. You didn't wash all the post skin off of your hands. That is not just normal, neat, orderly, and, and comfort. You might have a tad of that OCD, talking about a mood disorder. Don't be diagnosing your coworker. See, that's why she didn't want to share with you, Mr. Cook. <laughs> Look, he's cutting his eyes at you. I know, I know. <laughs> so does your desire for everything to be neat and orderly in your office, does it disrupt your other co-workers? Yeah. Okay. I haven't been diagnosed, but I... But you're able to function. But it, yeah, I'm able to function. Now, that, that neat order and see whenever it's thrown off, I don't function well. Yeah. So you got to do, you got to do it. Okay. Yeah. So we're also going to look at some anxiety disorders. I, I, I don't make it. Everybody is not aware of it, though. I don't make. Um, it's just a joke with us. More than anything. I don't let everybody don't see it, but I, I really can't. I, I don't function well. I got a video today I'm going to show you all, and hopefully you'll be able to see. Hopefully it's not going to be you, but it's going to be different. It's the scene from um, Monk, where he goes to the doctor, and he changes up everything. He takes the cotton balls, and the blood was different in the different vials that was there, so he mixes the blood to make them even. But see, he because something yesterday, I don't use it, and he said, can I, you know, you know. You count. Yeah, I find yeah. myself sometimes counting things. Yeah, counting stuff. Years ago, it was real like, bad. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you all. I believe you all are institutionalized. Y'all done been, you know, around a little bit too long. So, okay. Uh, we're going to talk about anxiety disorders and also panic disorders. So let's look at depression for the first topic. So when you see this guy come up on the screen, did you, would you ever have thought he had depression? Yes. Why? What was symbolic for depression? So we're talking about Robin Williams, if you all can't see. So Robin Williams, the comedian who was making everybody else laugh. What would make you say he was depressed? If you ever listen to his stand-up, his stand-up was very dark. But he always threw in that humor. And they always say that the most depressed people are the biggest clowns. Mm -hmm. So could it be that the drug addiction from the 70s changed the chemical makeup in his brain? <coughs> Possibly. Possibly. Okay. Other thoughts about how this comedian could have been depressed and ended his life with suicide. Any other thoughts? Same thing as my 
So in looking at Robin Williams, his suicide and discovered, now as a public, we discovered that he had depression. It was a surprise to a lot of individuals because to hear he committed suicide because he appeared to be a guy who had had everything. Everything was going for him. He had money. He had prestige. He had the, the, the presence and the platform. But nobody really knew that he had a mental illness. Did you know? Did you know? Nobody knew he had a mental illness. Mm. So why don't people talk about clinical depression as much in our country? Like really being diagnosed, people may say, oh, I suffer with depression, you know, casually, but the depression to the point that you would successfully complete suicide. And um, Tracy, as you mentioned, you know, the clowns that often laugh and make everybody else happy may be struggling with some internal things that's going on, but externally it looks like everything is going right. It was the legendary R&B singer Smokey Robinson. He had a song that talks about the tears of a clown when no one's around. So you can get caught up in the funky beat and you dancing, you know, the tears of a clown when no one's around. But there's some truth to that. He had a second hit. I don't remember what year was popular, but the song went a little something like this. Just take a good look at my face. You see the smile seems out of place. If you look closer, it's easy to trace the tracks of my tears. So is it possible if we don't look close, if we're not paying attention, that we can miss a little glimpse, we can miss a little nugget that, gave, that could have given us insight that this person was suicidal? If we don't look close, we won't be able to trace the tracks of their tears. Because if they show up to work and like everything is okay, if they show up to group like everything is fine, and you have no idea they got a Dear John letter, because suicides do happen even in prison, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If we're not paying attention and consciously aware, sometimes the best of us as clinicians can miss it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Questions or comments? Thoughts? Reflections? Can you name some of the telltale signs of someone that might be suicidal? Giving away stuff. Giving away stuff. So if they're not normally a given and they constantly, all of a sudden they start giving away things, this may be a telltale sign. Or saying things like, well, if I don't see you again, I just want you to know. Mm -hmm. Making peace. Other telltale signs of suicide. Hopelessness, helplessness, tearfulness. But we'll cover more of detail about suicide this afternoon, but let's keep going. So bereavement. What is bereavement? In the DSM-5, the definition of bereavement somewhat changed. Because in the DSM-4, when we looked at depression, they kind of had some questions about bereavement because we were trying to decide should there be a time frame, not we, like me, per se, but the, the Amer ASAM folks, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, was trying to decide should we put a time frame on bereavement? When the truth of the matter is you can't really tell anybody how long they should grieve because there are some folks that may grieve two days, other folks may be grieving two months, somebody else may be grieving a loss for two years. So they had to separate bereavement from depression. Does that make sense to y'all? All right. So in this bereavement exercise, I want you to think about a time when you actually had to deal with grief, when you had to deal with the loss of something. Because can we be honest? People grieve more than just the death of someone. So if you lost your job, would you be grieving? Oh, okay. Because sometimes individuals grieve the loss of a relationship. 
you the, the loss of a particular car, if your car was repossessed or you lost an animal. So there's a number of different things that can lead someone to the place of bereavement. So we have to think outside of the box. Just because someone didn't experience a physical death in their family or in their life, they kill, still could be dealing with grief. You know, you put your all in all into a particular relationship and then it didn't work. Or the shame associated to something. It could be grief. What'd you say? Losing a pet. Oh yeah, that's a big deal for some people. That's like losing a kid. Yeah. So I want you to take a moment, think about a time when you've experienced any level of grief, any level of bereavement. So I want you to think about as you discuss what were the symptoms, or it could be someone else that you identified going through grief. What did grief look like? What did it sound like? What were some of the symptoms of grief? Um, so basically, society may frown upon it, but let's make a little list. What, does, what did grief look like for you? What did um, that season of loss look like? So can we take some words to describe what did grief look like? It looked like what? So sleeping a lot, or could it be sleeping more and sleeping less? I sleep more. So for some, let's put a up area for more sleep, but then for some people when they're grieving, they don't sleep at all. Does that make sense? Isolation. Isolation. So is this isolating from social activities, isolating from family, Everything. friends? Everything. Okay. What else does grief look like? Anger. Okay, you want to say a little bit more about that? Um, that's a, um, one of my go-to emotions is anger. Okay. I tend to react that way with a lot of things. And now that I know that there's more underlying anger as a reaction, but that is one of the go-to emotions for me. Okay. What about tears? Uncontrollable. Uncontrollable yeah. tears. Okay. Give you two examples, PTSD and then the loss of limbs. So PTSD on another level. If someone has lost a limb, could they grieve that leg? Mm -hmm. Ever heard people talk about they feel like that leg is there? Mm -hmm. They feel like the pain is still there mm -hmm. in that leg, loss of foot, loss of toe. Mm -hmm. So people grieve a lot of different things. So we have to open up our mind and our capacity to understand what does grief look like and bereavement, okay? Um, PTSD, so having been gone away to a different country, being trained to be a serial killer, think about this now, you've, you've been trained to be a weapon of mass destruction, and then you've been given two weeks to get reintegrated back into society. After you have been over there months and months and months and years, once you get over there, could you be grieving your family? But once you get back, could you also, it may sound strange, but grieve that particular place. Let's take it to our offender population for a moment. Is it possible that some of them actually grieve the structure of prison? Meaning someone telling you what to do, when to do it, every, so we call it institutionalization. But when they get home, they don't know how to function in society. Without that level of structure, someone saying, do this, do this, and do this. A lot of people don't want to admit that. But some of them may be grieving that level of structure. Does that make sense? Other examples of grief or bereavement. Okay. 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 What about substances? Do people tend to use drugs and alcohol when they're grieving? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So <laughs> use of, I'm going to put SUDS, so substance use disorder. All right. What else are some common symptoms of grief? Not being focused. Okay. Racing thoughts. Not focused. Okay, you said racing thoughts. 
others. Uh, okay, so illness is it certain types of illnesses? <coughs> it might be stomach disorders, uh, you know, headaches. Yeah, headaches. So when you say stomach disorders, is irritable bowel for some that associated too. to that grief, too. stress, that yeah. sort of thing? Yeah. That too. Okay, so we'll just put medical conditions. When people grieve, do they comply with medication? No. So could we see some psychotic outbreak? Mm -hmm. Grieving and just say, forget it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, lack of compliance with treatment. So we may also see some suicidal ideations when someone is grieving. We may see homicidal ideations. We start thinking about you lost a loved one and then now you want to go get even, you know, with everybody. You know, that may be still part of the grieving process. So it's kind of taking your anger to another level. So hopefully your anger, uh, I don't think we got to leave for that fire drill. <laughs> so I, I hope this is a practice fire alarm again like we had earlier today. So I'm going to keep talking. Uh, well, one of y'all go out there and check to make sure this is just a practice run. I'm, I'm going to keep talking. But... Um, if, if it's really a fire, we will okay. gladly escape. Oh, well, it stopped, so. Okay. Yeah, it stopped, so we cool. All right. Um, so suicidal and homicide is where I was at. So hopefully your anger issues is not to the point that you're ready to go out and pull the trigger. But some individuals don't have that buffer to actually know how to communicate or to, to communicate their anger without throwing them paws like that boy say on uh, Love and Hip Hop. What's the name? Y'all watch the show. I ain't watching a long time. He talk about throwing paws all the time, but that anger. Yeah, go ahead. But you just. know what, though? With, um, and I say this a lot. And maybe, I, I don't know. But anyway, you know, they, they said it's a thin line between love and hate. Mm -hmm. To me, there's, all, there's a thin line between sanity and insanity. Dude. Okay. Would you like to say a little bit more about that thin line? <laughs> I mean, no, but really though. I mean, you so are you saying you cross over from being insane to yeah, sanity? I mean, you, know, you, you know, if you allow yourself to cross, you don't want to. Yeah. So is this why folks pleading temporary insanity in our country? I, I, but, but really though, it is. It, 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 if you allow yourself to snap. Yeah, I, you know, you have to bring yourself back. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, and you know to do that. I'm, I, I, I'm the only one. Look, you looking around for support. They're like, I ain't, I ain't finna admit to that. I need my job. <laughs> <laughs> when you go, that happens, that pushes you across that line. You've right. never experienced that before. For what? And then something happens, <laughs> then you've completely lost it. Yeah. You don't know how to come out of it. And it, it's like with the PTSD, these men who sign up and go over and fight, they pass all these mental exams and everything, and they're perfectly fine. They go over there, they experience something, and they can't ever come back. Mm -hmm. And it could be with anything. It could be a loss of a child. I mean, if anything happened to my son, I would I would be locked up somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so and, and you do. If, if, if you allow yourself to. And so like she said, if you have situations or things that happen, you understand what I mean? It can take you to a dark place. Right, that's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, yeah. Well, Miss King, if you need somebody to help you, there was um, some hip hop rappers. I was standing here trying to think about it. But he, look, he said, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You, don't, you don't remember that song, Miss King? So that's your theme song, so you got permission. Just walk into the light, Miss King. Walk into, I'll walk into the light. I'll let somebody know. Please. <laughs> we don't need to be uh, taking up no, uh, what you call that, um, what they, uh, GoFundMe page for you some bail money. Okay, so with grief, could this whole laundry list of things, could it also be the same symptoms that looks like a different type of mental illness? So if someone is experiencing this level of anger, could that also be misdiagnosed as explosive personality yes. or conduct disorder? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If someone is constantly tearful 
Could it also be misread as clinical depression mm -hmm. when they grieve? If someone is sleeping a lot, mm -hmm. could that look like clinical depression as well? Isolation, mm -hmm. eating, mm -hmm. so they're overeating, you know, that could lead to some other things. So with all that being said, so the purpose of making that little list, that activity, was to show you that there are some common symptoms that may cross the lines of a multiplicity of different mental disorders. But we have to look at all of the um, criteria because there's a time frame and time parameters. So thus, people are being misdiagnosed. Questions and All right, so let's keep going, then I'll give y'all a little break. So major depressive disorder. So major depression, unlike normal sadness, grief, or bereavement, major depressive disorder is persistent and can significantly interfere with the individual's thoughts, behavior, activity, and physical health. Do you see a difference here? So major depression or clinical depression, we're talking about a significant interference. So we're talking about an individual maybe not being able to function, carry out their normal activities. Does that make sense to you? So at least two weeks uh, with at least half of these symptoms. So we're talking about this list of symptoms that you've observed. It has to be present for how long? Two weeks. At least two weeks. So Jody left with Big Baby. So you cried for three days. Does that qualify as clinical depression? No, get over it. So if um, you've been going through the motions and you can't function, I just can't go on, and my life, blah, 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 and you've been going through this for six months, based on this first criteria, at least two weeks, do they meet the criteria? Maybe, let's, let's look at the rest of it. You got to have some other stuff. So at least two weeks and with at least half of these symptoms that we're going to now go through. So in addition to having that symptom that lasts at least two weeks, do they also have some fatigue, loss of energy and activity, sadness and hopelessness, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt, irritability, agitation, anger issues that can lead to isolation. Do y'all see how this list is lining up? with this list that y'all just put for depression, not depression, for bereavement and grief. Oh, okay. The inability to concentrate or to make decisions. Um, psychomotor agitation, so restless or slowing. Less participation in and less enjoyment of activities normally enjoyed. That was anahondia. Didn't we also see anahondia with schizophrenia yesterday? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay then. Recurrent thoughts of death. Poor grooming and hygiene. So if you typically someone that was flossed, I mean, hair done, nails done, everything done, and then suddenly you sad, feelings of loneliness, isolation, you've lost some energy, sadness, you're not bathing, don't keep your hair up. Do you see how now we need to start looking? The symptoms is here. It's lasting longer than two weeks. Now we may need to start looking at this is not just a mood, but this may be actually clinical depression. All right. Um, change in vegetative signs. This is the change in the eating and also sleeping. The severity of major depression, the same way when we're doing a substance, um, a substance abuse assessment, we diagnose the person as having a mild, moderate, or severe um, diagnosis. So with the major depression, based on how many of the symptoms they said yes to or that you observed, you would say major depressive disorder, mild. Major depressive disorder, moderate. Major depressive disorder, severe. Or with psychotic features. Does that make sense to you? All right, let's keep going. Um, so rule out, definitely you want to always rule out the use of substances, drugs, alcohol, or medication. And you also have to rule out any other general medical condition. So there are some individuals, if they are a diabetic, for example, if their sugar levels get low, they got a whole different personality. And you like, you better get some orange juice or something real quick. Get your sugar up because you acting different. But then other individuals with thyroid conditions. So a medical condition can also change the mood. Doesn't mean that that person has clinical depression, but if their hypothyroid medication is off, if their sugar levels are off, it also with cancer and TBIs, the traumatic brain injuries, can also contribute to a change in mood, okay? 
All right. So the prevalence of major depression, according to the Global Burden of Disease Study, it predicts that by 2020, depression will be the leading cause of disability and premature death in the world. Among all medical illnesses, major depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States and many other developing countries. 17% of all people will experience major depressive episodes at some point in their life. Women, one in four, men, one in eight. Without treatment, 10 to 15% will attempt suicide. With treatment, the majority can recover. So any questions? All right, major, um, well, manic depression, also known as bipolar. And feel free, if you all need to take a break, you know, just get up and go, but I'm just keep rolling so we get through this big mood disorder section. All right, so if that's okay with y'all. All right, so bipolar for manic depression. So what is bipolar? Bipolar disorder or manic depression is an illness that causes extreme shifts in mood, energy, and functioning. These changes can be subtle or dramatic and typically vary over the course of a person's life. Did you know over 10 million people in America have bipolar disorder and the illness affects men and women equally? So let's talk about mania for a moment. I want you to think about the last time that you was at a concert, at a football game, basketball game. Have you seen some mania in action? Okay. So. Think about the mania when UNC wins the championship. Y'all remember that? These are some older pictures. What about this woman when she won the soccer championship? She was so excited that she pulled, she ripped the shirt off. Y'all remember that? So, I was recently at a concert. It's been several months ago. So, Charlie Wilson did this. Uh, I'm in it to win it tour. Anybody familiar with Charlie Wilson? I know y'all look at me like I'm crazy. But that's okay. Just hang tight. So, um, what was that other guy's name? So Fantasia was with him, and then there was this other guy who was out there. So it was several different acts. But when Uncle Charlie hit the stage, and the lights started going wild, next thing you know, I was up out of my seat. He was singing, good time, good, good. You know, my hands in the air. I was out in the aisle, dancing and everything, hyped up, right? Can you imagine being hyped up like you at the Charlie Wilson show every day for about six months? Can you imagine being that excited that you dancing the night away? You don't need any sleep. I don't need to eat. I'm on fire. That's what the manic phase of bipolar feels like. When your spouse or significant other is watching a football game and they're hollering and screaming, it's time to pound. I mean, I'm saying, come on. They can't even hear you talking to the TV. But folks, excited. I mean, they get real dumb. You know, Carolina was playing this weekend, and I was hearing people talking about, let's pound. I'm like, what are y'all talking about? They talking about the football game. Pound. You know, dab or something. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you can tell I don't watch it. But when some people just get that excited. But when we talk about bipolar disorder, that's similar, the best description we can give you about mania is when that person is so excited and like on 10, like just like that, and stays at that level of 10 for a period of time of multiple days, weeks, and months. That's tiresome. I'm about woke you all out with my energy just today, but can you imagine dealing with somebody like that on 10 all day, every day? That's similar to what the manic phase of bipolar is like. For many individuals, that concert excitement doesn't compare to a bipolar pe person with a sh on a shopping spree or a person with bipolar who's out having random reckless sex or an individual that's gambling and stays at the sweepstakes or the casino day in, day in, and day out. Remember the Rolling Stones concerts in the 70s? Those women would get so excited, they was hollering and screaming and tearing off parts of their undergarments and throwing it on the stage. Look at them. So this picture describes it a little better. They're hollering and screaming. Man, the end of World War II, there was a lot of excitement. Look at the, all the people standing and they're cheering. 
the end of the wars. So in this picture, in this video clip, it's going to demonstrate another level of mania. Let me turn the lights off. The whole time you're rooting for this Hemingway guy to survive the war and to be with the woman that he loves, Catherine Barton. It's 4 o'clock in the morning, Pat. And he does. He does. He survives the war after getting blown up. He survives it, and he escapes to Switzerland with Catherine. You think he ends it there? No! She dies, Dad! I mean, the world's hard enough as it is, guys. Can't somebody say, hey, let's be positive? Let's have a good ending to the story? Pat, you owe us an apology. Mom, I, for, I can't apologize. I'm not going to apologize for this. You know what I will do? I will apologize on behalf of Ernest Hemingway. Because that's who's to blame him. Yeah, have Ernest Hemingway call us and apologize to us, too. <laughs> so what happened in this video, y'all? What happened? The guy's bipolar. He's reading a book. But he gets so involved in the book that it pissed him off. He get up, and what does he do? He goes into his parents' room, and he's arguing with them, 4 o'clock in the morning, telling them, pacing the floor, ranting and raving about a book. Is that normal? No. Okay, then. So mania can look a lot of different with our clients. So let's look at the symptoms. Most of these symptoms need to last at least how long? A week. A week. Or result in a psychiatric hospitalization. Because some folks, you already know, something is off and wrong. I'll give you an example. So a particular um, client won't use his name, but for the sake of understanding. I just knew from the telltale signs that he was at a manic phase. If I show up at the facility and he got a hospital mask on and he's sitting out there saying, Welcome to Lodabar. Okay, we need to get you on to the hospital. And so if you just kind of weigh and just think, okay, we'll see what happened. Because this is what happened really at this particular facility. We didn't know what was going on. We saw the hospital mask. Didn't even know he had a hospital mask in his possession. But then next thing you know, he's walking outside, just as jaybird, just as naked as a jaybird. <laughs> but he got his hospital mask on, welcome to lower bar. <laughs> and then hypersexual activity and symptoms. So these are the things, mania looks different for different people. Some have psychotic features, but you need to know your clients to the point that you know when they're going to a psychotic level or mania is on the break or something is a bit off. Does that make sense? And Lord knows if they're on all these psychotropic medications and they mix some weed with it or they mix some crack with it or some alcohol with it, oh, they really going to be a basket case. And you need to know what to do, when to get them to the psych psychiatric center, to the hospital, so they can help bring them back to baseline quick versus letting them decompensate and go on for weeks and weeks. Does that make sense to you? So the whole crust of that example is knowing your clients. That you ought to know them when they start doing certain things or saying things. You know, those are some telltale signs that this is they're not in a good place. So getting them to mental health and to see the doctor is going to be important. Yeah, because I had one when I was doing community supports. I could tell when woman was starting to come because she would start cleaning, obsessive. You can come by the house and you always smell like pine so around that time when you would she would start. She would start cleaning everything, mm -hmm. then she would start moving the furniture around and things like that. And so after that, she had she had to go into the hospital for some reason or go back and get her meds adjusted. But that was for some reason that was her thing. That was always a, a sign that she was about to go into a manic phase. Right. She, she would clean just gotta clean everything, gotta clean, gotta clean. Awesome. All right. Often mania is either in one elated happy mood or mania can also be irritable angry mood. So mania is always going to include elevated energy, racing thoughts, flights of ideas, so non-stop talking and talking quickly. Oh my God, Tracy, let me tell you about this sale at J.C. Penis. Oh, Claudia, did you know that such and such and such is happening? Mr. Cook, did I tell you about this? And so they're going on and on and on and you like, woo. You about to make me tired. 
Can you calm down? So they're trying to get this out because their thoughts is racing and they need to get it all out because more and more stuff just keep coming to them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I know I just did that little role play for y'all. But do we have clients who act like that? And you like, woo, come on, just take a break. All right, so other manias, um, symptoms of mania include grandiose, bulletproof, charming attitude, someone who's laughing for no apparent reason, um, other symptoms, taking risks that they typically would not take, um, impulsive spending sprees, sexual indiscretion, and alcohol abuse. So I have a lot of stories related to Charter Hospital because I worked there so long um, as an undergrad student. But we had a particular woman on the unit that her family had been looking for her for months. She was, of course, bipolar, had bipolar. But the way they was able to find her was through this excessive spending sprees. They was able to locate her. I mean, the family had like the um, FBI and everybody looking for her because she was a missing person. But she had that credit card and she was going on all these spending sprees, leaving astronomical tips like a thousand dollars for a tip. Man, I'm like, oh, okay, that was a blessing for that waitress, whoever that was. But it was the spending sprees. Once they brought her back to baseline, the medications and, and such, her family was able to be notified where she was in North Carolina. But she was like from. Arkansas somewhere. So we don't know how in the world she ended up all the way in North Carolina. But through the excessive spending sprees and she was in a manic phase without medication. You see the, uh, what is it, those, uh, is it silver alerts? Yeah. You know, and they'll, they'll, when I, I used to stay in Florida a lot. Like that. But now they give you the silver alert and they'll say, person has a mental illness. So you oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, they'll say the person has a mental illness or the person is without their mental, their medication, hasn't had their medication. They get more specific more specific. Because at one time people would think silver alert was just older adults. But now they specify if it's a mental illness. But go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, if you're all right, um, in Florida, you, you see that all the time. Up here you don't see it as often. In Florida, it's really bad. Yeah. Because they it's, it's regular here, but really? I don't want to get into my political stance, but some things are reported for some people that's not always reported for others. Let's say oh, if little right. Timmy always walking out getting gone at the first of the month and he done went on a crack binge and he left the facility, they probably not going to put that on the, on the silver alert because this is a pattern for him. Right. That the first of the month he going to get MIA and get missing and he going to show back up around the 15th because he ain't got no money. Yep. But then... You know, there are some other things that begin to happen as it relates to what's being reported and what's not. Um, so some people will argue and say um, certain classes of people, certain ethnicities, things get reported. Um, like, for example, um, there was a bunch of girls that was missing, um, I'm not sure, in the D.C. area, and no Amber Alerts were set for them. But then Amber Alerts are set more um, frequent for other groups of people. So not sure what the parameters are, what the rules are related to that. But we know there are some discrepancies. Oh. Well, I'm going to stay in my lane, in my pay grade for that. <laughs> you know, some fights you just don't want to pick. Like, okay, I'll observe it. Yeah. All right. So minimum for sleep and night. So this actually happens a lot with persons with bipolar. So causes of bipolar, we don't know exactly what causes bipolar, but it's likely caused by, a multiple, by multiple factors that interact to produce a chemical imbalance in certain parts of the brain. So yesterday we talked about the frontal lobe, the precipital lobe, the occipital lobe, so those different parts of the brain and what those responsibilities are for that brain, for that particular part of the brain. So if a chemical imbalance occurs, so yesterday just kind of reviewed from yesterday and today, if the neurons and the neurotransmitters aren't sending, receiving, and processing information, the chemicals in the brain, so things are off balance. So the brain, that part of the brain that's responsible for functioning, if that's off, do you not think their personality is going to be off? That their mood is going to be off? So we're talking about a chemical imbalance. So what the medication does, supposedly, is if they're off balance, if their brain function looks like this, then you want to put them on the medication to bring them back to a baseline. Does that make sense to you? All right. So um, bipolar can also run in families. Um, it could be a stressful environment.